dude. Just like, yeah. Welcome home. This is the Residency Podcast. I am Jeff Tomasic with Drew Belcher and Lil Raven. Yes, sir. Bringing you the biggest guests and stories in entertainment, business, pop culture, and sports from our studio on the Las Vegas Strip inside the Mandalay Bay. Make sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. You know the drill. This episode is brought to you by Mandalay Bay. Absolute legends are performing at Mandalay Bay next month. Don't miss Snoop Dogg and Ice Cube with special guest Warren G. West Coast. Oh, shit. I know. Great. Michelob Ultra Arena on May 14th. Uh, the Las Vegas Aces are also finally back chasing a championship, and their first home game is on May 8th at Michelob Ultra Arena as well, which is huge. We love that here for the casino. And if Latin music is more your vibe, then you can check out the Vegas Latin Summer Beach Fest with a bunch of incredible artists from May 20th to 22nd here on property. As always, come say what's up at our studio inside the Sportsbook of Mandalay Bay. We want to say what's up to you. We got a special NFL Draft Edition episode. Yes, sir. This is big time. Today we have media mogul, CEO of Vayner Sports, notorious Jets fan, AJ Vaynerchuk. What's going on, man? Welcome to the show. All good. Appreciate you guys having me. Welcome. Man. You, feel, you feel the Vegas energy I yet? do. Are I loved it. I walked in. You know, I just landed like a minute ago, and uh, I walked in with my buddy Chris, who works at Vayner with me, and like the second I stepped in here, I was just like, ah, I, lo- I love it here. Now, I'm only here for like 12 hours, so... That's a bummer, but I, I love Vegas. I did my bachelor party here. Um, oh, really? So I'm a Vegas guy. Any, yeah, ba- any, any bachelor party stories you want to <laughs> say? You came and went, that's it? <laughs> well, I, listen, I'm a little bit of a square, uh, and I am married. And so, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm clean cut, clean edge. So my bachelor party was actually more focused on sports than anything, which okay. adds up given what I do for a living now. This was before Vayner Sports. We came in for uh, the tournament, open weekend tournament. See, so we okay, flew cool. in Wednesday night. We had 22 of us, and uh, we set up shop. Classic 22 bro trip. No, were you up at, you were up at 8 o'clock getting ready? 100%. For the whole yeah, yeah for we, were, sure. we were putting in our bets. We did the classic thing where we're like, all right, you know what? Let's start off slow. Let's do this like team thing. We all bet Notre Dame to cover against Northeastern in the first round. I want to say it was like Notre Dame might have been like a four seed, and Northeastern was a 13. Notre Dame was maybe like eight or nine point favorites. We all bet it. And we all went pretty heavy. We're like, let's get off to a good start. Let's pick a nice, safe yeah. bet. A little four-seat action. Uh, then there was like maybe 45 seconds less in the game. And Northeastern was up four. And we were just rooting for Northeastern because we couldn't cover at that point. Oh, oh, and we were just so mad at Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah. So we lost that first bet altogether. It ended up being a big upset day. But I crushed it. I, all I do is bet Moneyline underdogs. Um, again, this is before. I don't bet anymore because I'm a sports agent. I'm registered in NFL, MLB, NBA. So I don't touch it anymore. But yeah. when I did... Um, I bet like Georgia Southern, if you remember that oh, team wow. with the uh, the kid. I think it was uh, uh, I can't remember the kid's name. Celtics drafted this kid. He was a guard. He was the star of the team for Georgia Southern, and his dad was the coach. And his dad had like a leg injury. He was on the scooter, and his son. I think his son's first name was R. J. Hunter. Okay. Pretty sure it was R. J. Hunter. R.J. Hunter hit like a game winner. They were plus a thousand, and the dad, who's the head coach, falls off like. Dude, I remember me- this. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I exactly. Remember and so this. like that hit UAB hit for like plus like I hit three or four massive plus one thousand. It was a huge upset opening weekend. That's awesome. I love was, to hear. I love so to hear fun. some victories. It was so fun. By the way, is it is that a rule that sports agents? I think it's sport by sport, and I don't know if it's explicit, but I'm just it's just easier not to touch it. No, sure, sure, sure. And, sure. and honestly, like. A big reason I used to bet sports was to have skin in the game, right? I grew up a diehard Jets and Knicks fan, and so when the Jets and Knicks play, I I was really invested. Yeah. Or even when there was like playoff implications, of course. And you know, if it's like the Heat are playing like the Nuggets and it's late in the season, and I need the Heat to lose, like I'll root for the Nuggets. I'll have an interest for sure. For sure. And then when I would gamble is when like I had no interest in the game, but Two I love sports. Teams, so let me, yeah. you know, like so March Madness loved betting March Madness to have skin in the game. But now that I represent, you know, Vayner Sports represents 150 professional athletes across yeah. a bunch of different sports. Like, I'm emotionally invested in so many games that I don't need the betting itch anymore. You're like the real life fantasy yeah, aspect, yeah, just way, rooting for the players, right? right? <laughs> like, excuse me, we have now we have like 50 plus NFL players. I off the top of my head, we maybe miss one or two teams, so like every game matters to me, right? For sure. And so I don't need to bet anymore. So yeah. I don't, even if I could, I wouldn't care to. 
I mean, that makes sense, especially if you have that big of a roster across right. all these all these sports. Yeah. There's enough to worry about with just, exactly. just them performing yeah, you're well. Exactly. For those individual Rather than the spread covering, things. you know? Exactly. Sure. Too much stress. Exactly. Well, we want to go back a little bit, give our listeners a little bit of perspective. You started Vayner Sports, or excuse me, Vayner Media yep. with Gary a long yep. time ago. Uh, we're obviously all very interested in this because you guys grew it so much. What was the journey like scaling Vayner, Vayner Media from the beginning yeah. to 500 employees when you left? Yeah. Uh, it was a roller coaster. It was okay. chaos. Um, it was a, initially a bit of a slow build. So we started in 09. I was 22, fresh out of school. We literally started it like a month before I graduated. So that <laughs> last month of college, I was like doing finals and client work. And like we kind of just got it started because it moved a little bit quicker than we thought. Right. Um, day after I walked for graduation, went to school in Boston, Boston University. Literally the day I walked, I walked off the stage. I got into my parents' car. They drove me home. I was in Manhattan and our office was open the next day. Wow. Uh, hired a few friends of mine from high school and college to kind of get it rolling. And uh, it was a little bit of a slow grind because we were pretty ahead of the curve. Social media, we were more convinced about social media's ability for marketing than the rest of the world. So we probably went from, you know, the call it the six of us um, in 09 to the first two years, we probably had like 25 people at the end of year or two. Like it was wow. good, we were doing yeah. good business. Did the, your high school friends like stay with you throughout the, the way? Two of them are still there. Oh Let's wow, go. that's incredible. Okay. Guys, really pick that? your high school friends right, you know right? what I mean? Because <laughs> yeah. you never like, know. Two of them outlasted me by a lot. Uh, three of the four outlasted me. Uh, one, so I only stayed with the media and advertising agency for seven years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of my college buddies left about a year and a half, two years after me, he, he stayed for eight and a half, nine years. And then two of my high school buddies are still there. That's sick. Networking That's awesome. is key, guys. You either pick your friends that are dirt bags or pick the ones that start VaynerMedia. There's just <laughs> <Yeah>. two lanes. <laughs> There's two cool. lanes. A, a few other friends of mine in high school and college joined along the way. That's like, great. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, it was only like 25 people those first two years. And then we exploded. Um, in year three, we went from 25 to a buck 50. And then we went from a buck 50 to 250, then 250 to four, four to six. And then I left. Wow. Did you like it better, small? I did. Like scrappy yeah. fighting, or did yeah. you like it better when you had like a mega? No, I liked it. There's pros and cons to everything. Right. I think. Grass is always greener type of Grass is always greener. Right. I would say that um, I prefer the smaller, more intimate team. You know, one thing that I experienced one day, uh, right before I decided to leave, was I got into an elevator and I hit the floor, I think we were, I forget, we were in like six different offices in seven years, so I forget which building this was, but I think 24th floor or whatever, and I hit the button, three more people come in, everybody looks at the elevator and they just let it ride. So, all right, we're all going to the 24th floor. And of those three people in the elevator with me, I didn't know if they worked for me, I didn't oh. know if they were a client, I didn't know if they were a vendor. And I hated that feeling. Sure. Mm. Um, just disconnected. Yeah, just feeling yeah. disconnected. So I like the more, you know, right now Vayner Sports is 35 people, I know every single person, like we have 150 clients, but I know all, what's easier about the client side is like the athlete is the client. Yes. There is no Mr. Pepsi or Mrs. Campbell's. Like it's, it's <laughs> yeah, it a person that yeah, right. is a decision maker at those companies. So like I know all our clients because those are the clients that like I deal with and I interact and they don't like Stipe Miocic doesn't leave Stipe Miocic. He is Stipe Miocic. Right, right, Whereas right. like somebody who that's running marketing for Pepsi can then be running marketing for a different brand, right? Yeah, and so sure. I know all of our clients, I know all of our employees, and like I like it better that way. Um, now, bigger, it was nice having more infrastructure, right? When I left, I had all these people reporting into me and I had all that, and so I had to get my hands dirty again mm -hmm. starting up Vayner Sports, but I didn't mind that. But yeah, I'd be lying, you know. I didn't have an assistant for the first two years of Vayner Sports after having an assistant for the final five years of Vayner Media, stuff like that. Yeah. The luxuries that come with building a of big, successful business, but I prefer the stage that I'm in now. That's it's such awesome. a huge difference because we all have owned s smaller businesses and yeah. no, and I think when you're in a smaller business, the one thing you want is like, grow, get bigger, grow, mm -hmm. get bigger, for grow, sure. get bigger. And it's funny to hear that once you do get there, you're like, man, this is not as all, all it was cracked up to be yeah. from like grass is always perspective, greener. right? Grass is always greener. Yeah. Um, now the grow and get bigger was great from a financial perspective um but i think oh the money was nice yeah the money was nice <laughs> okay <laughs> that's uh, it but but i would say that um i'm also a believer that sometimes you can have your cake and eat it too of course sure yeah. so um i think a oh, vayner media is so interesting to all of us and all the listeners out there and everyone who's kind of watched you and gary the growth of vayner media and how what it's become now you guys got some incredibly massive clients in the very beginning yeah 
What was the first or the most important major client that you guys got, and how did you win them over when not a lot of people really trusted yeah. what your guys' direction was in the and beginning? The was, yeah. So I was very lucky as a co-founder to have a business partner, co-founder, brother, mentor in Gary that was 11 years older and already successful. Mm. A huge advantage um, that we had that we were able to leverage for the success of VaynerMedia in the early onset was that my father's business that my brother helped grow quite a bit was in the wine world. And uh, based in Jersey where I grew up, my dad had and still has one of, if not the biggest uh, wine and liquor stores in the state and a massive online e-commerce business that started in 1996. Wow. And uh, That's crazy. what was yeah. cool about that from a luck perspective is that um, there's a lot of big business in CPG in that New Jersey area. You know, Johnson & Johnson, Campbell's, mm -hmm. on and on and on. A lot of big corporate HQs. Right. And when you think about like the business that my father and my brother built, Wine Library, there was a lot of high-end customers. A lot of those high-end customers were those C-suite executives okay. yeah. at these corporations. And so Gary already knew high-end decision makers in the ad world. And they knew him and they knew the type of business that he built and the type of person he was. And so we really tapped into his existing network to get us some of those first clients early. Um, you know, We were early with the New York Jets, Campbell's Soup, Pepsi, the National Hockey League, and those are all New Jersey, New York-based businesses mm -hmm. in which decision makers were people that my brother already knew from prior business. The Jets was act were actually a client? Yeah, Jets were our first client. Wow, that's sick. First client ever? First client for VaynerMedia was the Jets. Jets. Did you and Gary look at each other when you signed the Jets? Like, what just happened? Yes and no, because again, my brother already knew um, our wine store donated a lot of product to like their charity events and sure. auctions yeah, locally, yeah. so we were already connected. and. Uh, to the gentleman's credit, uh, still a business partner of ours today, Matt Higgins, dear friend. Matt was the president of the Jets at the time, and uh, he saw the vision, and frankly, we weren't expensive at first, right? It was a great gamble. We were charging like five grand a month for our work at, back in 09, because nobody wanted to spend on social Sold. media. Sold, yeah, the Jets yeah, can afford deal. that. Sold. Good. Yeah, good. exactly, all right. exactly, and so, um, like to sign for a 10 year deal, please. Right. Well, we never did that. We <laughs> yeah. always, we always just kept raising the price based on the quality of, of the course. work. But, um, so yeah, again, I, I can't take much of any credit for that. Um, just lucky sperm club in the sense that I had an older brother that, uh, was already successful and well connected in the art of business. And he sourced our few clients that way. And he honestly, Gary sourced most of our clients. <laughs> Lucky Sperm Club. I like yeah. that. That's good. That's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's a, a, a T-shirt. I, I, get, I get people asking me, you know, because I've done well in my career and I have a lot of advice that I can give. The question I always laugh at is like, AJ, how do I pick a co-founder? Like you're asking the guy that's brother, like <laughs> his co-founder, like, I don't know, tell your parents yeah. to make another kid. Be better. Like, yeah. I, 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 I'm the last person uh, to ask that. Yeah. Ask your sibling. What, yeah, what yeah, happened? Yeah, exactly. You know, why are, what they, are you guys why doing? They yeah. Damn it. Uh, I love that. By the way, uh, you know, Gary, you always talk publicly about buying the Jets. You know, are we from first? I'm just reading this PR story right yeah. now. Right. From first Full client circle. to owner. Yeah. Oh, listen. There's a Disney movie to be had. That's 100. Cool. Oh. Uh, I mean, it goes well beyond. Like, you know, I, I don't know how much you guys know about the coming to America story from my family, but like, my brother learned English by watching sports, and the Jets were his first team, and like, moving into this small neighborhood in New Jersey when he was like when my parents brought, came over, and he was like six or seven, and first friend he made was like, hey, do you have a favorite football team? My brother's like, what's football? And he's like, you're a Jet fan. Like, it's a real Disney story. That's awesome. when, when Gary buys the team, it, he'll then probably turn it into a movie. Let's, who's so, playing you? Who's playing me? Yeah. Depends on when Gary gets enough money. By <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it takes him 20 more years, it might be somebody right. that's Some, on the come up. A little yeah. older, yeah. yeah. Who's playing Gary? Who's going to grow into Gary's role? I don't role? know. That's I don't funny. know. Again, timing. Yeah. It depends sure, on how sure. fast he makes that money. Yeah, because it's on him. I'm not buying the team. I dipped out of that a long time ago. Got like, it. You know, when I left Fainer Media, I, that was the time where I decided, okay, like finances were not going to be my number one metric for success. If it goes that way. Yeah. And so, but when Gary buys the team, I'll have 10, 20, 30 years of experience on the other side. Of, you know, if you look at some of the best general managers in sports, they were an agent first. Mm. So there's that piece too. That's nice. You heard it here first, guys. Disney movies being made. Oh, it's deal. It'll happen. Yeah, Let's awesome. go. <laughs> yeah. um, we're all entrepreneurs here, and yeah. we wanted something a little bit relatable for us and our listeners. Can you think of one like super frustrating day you've had as as something that we can all relate to being an entrepreneur? <laughs> sure. Of the many. <laughs> of the many. Sure. For sure. Yeah, a ton. Um, I'll give you a recent one. I'll speak candidly. Uh, I led the charge on an NFT project that we launched for the sports agency about three weeks ago. Yeah. 
and the launch was extremely successful, but it was also extremely problematic. Um, we had what is called in the industry a gas war, where mm, there was saw this. yeah there was way more demand gas war. Um, than the the blockchain could handle, and there was a lot of things that we could have done better to mitigate against that. Um, and what was cool too is you got to see a couple projects in the last few weeks, see what happened to me and us and adapt. Nice. Uh, you know, it was a very popular project called Moonbirds that launched and the, the CEO the and founder, most popular yeah, project yeah. Moonbirds that yeah. launched. Yeah. Probably the most successful launch of all time. The 100%. most popular launch of all time. If you actually look, um, Kevin Rose, the CEO and founder of Moonbirds put out a video like a day or two after our situation. It was like, Hey, we're changing our launch plan for Moonbirds. And he spent two minutes talking about me, my brother, and us, and saying, like, hey, like, those guys are great, but, like, some of the shit they walked into, like, we don't want to walk into. Yeah. And then my brother had V-Friends this week, and he, he adapted. And so I like to say that I fell so others could run. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that was, a, that was a terrible day. I spent 36 hours getting obliterated for um, this gas war that ended up sucking out tens of millions of dollars out of the ecosystem. And, you know, some of it I could have done a better job. Some of it is not my fault. But yeah. as the leader of the project, I'm at the head of the table. And, I, you know, I, it's like uh, being the quarterback of a team. You get too much credit when things go well and you get too much blame when things don't. For sure. And that, I think that's the role that I had to play. And so, yeah, I mean, those 36 hours, I probably slept three or four hours in those 36. And it was predominantly me reading co uh, context of how much I sucked and how stupid I was and how much I fucked it up. And I just took it on the chin and I responded to everybody. And thankfully, I think everybody saw and kind of after 36 hours kind of like settled in and right. saw that, you know, some of it's my fault. Some of it's not my fault. I'm taking accountability. We have a plan forward. We ended up doing a massive refund. We refunded about 600 grand uh, due to some issues that were directly uh, our fault. And so I think people saw that, like, I just didn't take the money and put my head in the sand. And it worked out OK in the end. But, yeah, that was a tough day. Yeah, the worst uh, part about the gas war is that no one gets the money. It's just exactly. It's, it's not just, like I banked that twenty yeah, million bucks. Yeah, it's just it's a ton of money that people spend out there. The one benefit, the one positive thing is that obviously the project was popular, which is why 100%. gas wars yeah. happened. We sold is, out in seventeen minutes. Yeah, so that's fifteen thousand five hundred fifty-five tokens in seventeen minutes. So it was successful. But again, there's things I could have done better, and I took it on the chin for it. Yeah, we, I almost got smoked with a gas war when Carefru were launched, mm -hmm. and I just I woke up at five thirty in the morning to, <laughs> to almost pay seventy thousand dollars in gas. I didn't do it. <laughs> well done. Yeah. I didn't do exactly. it. I didn't do it. Uh, Clearly good decision making. Yeah, one, <laughs> here. 100%. Uh, by the way, congratulations on the project. Thank I'm you. a big proponent of NFTs. He's uh, our big uh, NFT uh, guy. I'm a big I'll, fan. I'll, I'll I love that. And I watched the project, so incredible to see it come about. Thank you. Uh, I'll dip. I'll, later we're going to ask about it, but yep. what do you think the future of NFTs are in the sports world now? I, I think it's us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my, my answer to that question is embodied within the project. So sports NFTs are an interesting place. Uh, I am excited and do have a heavy belief that a lot of the sports collecting culture will shift there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I grew up collecting sports cards. I love sports cards. I have a nasty sports card collection. And I did it as a kid and I did it as an adult. I did it like hardcore when I was seven, hardcore when I was 13, hardcore when I was 18, hardcore three or four years ago. Like I've always loved it. I'm always about it. And there's a lot of traditionalists that don't want to let that go. Right. But in my opinion, that's going to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to end up bleeding into one another. I'm not saying physical products are going to disappear. We're, we're humans. But the, the ease at which you can collect a player's card on NBA Top Shot or buy a pack on NFL all day versus, you know, going to eBay or your local card store, getting it shipped and having to make sure you take care of it and not fuck up the corners and ship it to PSA or BGS to get it graded where it all just happens on your phone or on your laptop. I don't, because I don't think you can replace that. And for me, why, I don't know why people are so precious about a piece of cardboard with ink on it, right? Like, again, I love it, but let's boil it. Like, people are like, well, it's just a picture on your phone. Well, that's just a piece of cardboard with some inkjet on it, right? Yeah. Like, we, those sports cards are valuable because our society decided to ascribe value to it. Yeah. The same thing is going to happen with NFTs. And so, um, and that's already happening. Human behavior is already doing it with things like Carafu and Vayner Sports Pass and V Friends and Moonbirds and yeah. like all that stuff, right? So it's already happening and it's seamless and it's better and it's less fraud. Like I would sell a card on eBay, I ship it out and like 
five to ten percent of the time people tell me they didn't get the package or it showed up yeah, damaged of course. Or, or didn't pay like i would sell a card for like three grand i'd be pumped and then like eight days later i'm like oh this person never paid me they just won the auction and just ghosted like that doesn't happen with nfts right yeah. you can't there's no such thing as selling an nft and not being paid because it's a smart contract that both people sign for the transaction to go through and it happens instant mm -hmm. and so i just think it's a, a complete improvement on the collectability so i think that's going to happen in a big way um, Gary's on the board of a company called Candy that's really paving the way in that regard. Um, you know, they, they've actually scooped up big licenses on the physical side as yeah. well as the digital side. And then on my end with the Vayner Sports Pass, we're big on providing that utility. Like I think these like Buzzword. loyalty programs and membership aspects that can happen on the blockchain versus like uh, a more traditional method, I think is just really powerful. Um, there's a lot of creative things that you can do and a lot that you can do with it. And so we're excited to to hopefully pave the way for how utility gets done in sports. So my belief is that hospitality, right? Cause this is kind of our world. Yeah. We're all from Las Vegas. Yep. We are, we bleed this. We, we live this every single day is that NFTs are the future of what hospitality is somehow going to repackage I, how people it. enjoy things in real life. One of the Full things that I loved experience. about the Vayner sports pass was that you market a lot of what's going, the benefits and utility yep. of the holders are going to be a lot of stuff in, in real life. Correct. Though. And it's yeah. going to be a lot of what activations with your athletes yep. and attendance at sports events. Or can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, we're, we're doing all that. It's yeah. all in play. Um, I think that, again, with the pass, I see it as like a loyalty program mm -hmm. that is fully on the blockchain and gives us a lot of ability to slice and dice. So, for example, um, what's kind of unique about our utility pass compared to some other projects is that all 15,555 are unique. So most utility member passes are identical. Yeah. It's like all 1,000 are the same. All are unique. And you have different colors and different um, icons and different number of icons. So you might have a pass that's blue and has a football and a baseball on it. You might have a pass that's yellow and has uh, a volleyball and a tennis racket on it. And you might have one that's diamond. We borrowed it from the V Friends uh, world where it's diamond and it has baseball, MMA, hockey, and golf on it. And so there's different passes, different rarities, and we're going to be doing things where there's going to be digital and physical experiences that are associated with the type of pass you have. So, yep. for example, um, your football pass might be eligible for a raffle for Super Bowl tickets down the line. Your golf pass might get you an opportunity to go to the Masters. And because your pass is diamond, you might have a better chance of winning the Masters ticket than somebody that has an orange or a blue or a yellow pass. So there's a lot of game theory that we can play with, and we're really excited about it. I, I, I'm just such a massive proponent of the, the cross section between <laughs> NFTs and the world right now. So you're not starting a donut shop and then giving free donuts no. and money grabbing people. <laughs> no. Okay, cool. Because that's where I the have plan. the issue is there's so many, agree with me, I know you are. The majority of <laughs> NFT projects coming onto the are market trash. are strictly yes. Yes. money grabs yeah. made by vulture entrepreneurs that just totally. want to get that ton up money up front and never do anything. I hate the words, the trigger words, utility, utility. Yeah. community, no, I get it. Yeah. bridging it's true, the gap. It's true. Yeah. There's it's so true. many bullshit projects and I'm like, yeah. dude, that is a money grab. Yeah. Do not give those people. The thing that I'm big on, and I'm sorry to interrupt, no, go, is that go. you're absolutely right. Thank but you. But in my opinion, NFTs, the internet, websites, social media, restaurant business, hotel business, sports business, it's just a reflection of human nature. Right. Yeah. Every industry has scumbags. Yeah. Every industry yeah. has people that are doing money grabs. Every industry has liars and frauds and, and cheats and thieves. Like, <clears throat> yeah, it's super prevalent on NFTs. And guess what? It's super prevalent in every industry. Yeah, for sure. That's how for I sure. see it. Um, but yeah, 90-something percent of projects are absolute trash. Something I take pride in is like we're fully doxxed. I think that matters. We have a longstanding reputation as businessmen and operators. We have a longstanding reputation in crypto. Bought my first Bitcoin in 2013, bought my first Ethereum in 2014. The fund my brother and I had invested in Coinbase in 2015. Like, we didn't just show up and say, oh, there's money here. Like, sure. we've been yeah. in sure. this industry. Yeah, the bigger guys, the bigger players paving the way, like yourself and a couple others that are starting that foundation, you don't benefit at all from doing a money grab. Nope. At all. Yeah, yeah. It, it probably hurts you and here, destroys here's you. Here's the other thing. Like, and, and this is a little bit pompous to say, but it's the truth. There's no amount of money that I can make that is worth sacrificing, compromising my last name. Good. There's sure. way too much at stake. Like the Vayner, the Vaynerchuk name at this point, based mostly on what my brother has done and some of what I have done, has way too much long-standing value for generations. Frankly, like we, my brother has kids. I have kids. We have a sister with kids. Like this Vaynerchuk name is going to matter for decades and decades and decades and ideally generations. And so doing a cash grab would just completely compromise so much. It just wouldn't be the right, if, if, our, if we're capitalists and our 
plan is to make as much money as possible, doing a short-term cash grab is the worst thing we could do. For sure. and, I, and I also think Agreed. now the one big benefit since over the past 18 months when NFTs just went completely crazy is that there, it was really tough to differentiate between them. Now that some respectable projects with larger names yep. attached to them, and like you said, being doxxed and giving everyone transparency on who's running it and why, and obviously naming it after your last right. name gives it a little bit of- I think so. Yeah, ex you know, some comfortability with everyone. I think the more projects that are legitimate after, the more people are going to be able to start the separation between the bad ones and the good ones are gonna start coming. Because in the very beginning, they all look the same, right? They were yeah. all just, Melting pit bulls and oh, flaming totally. flamingos. Yeah. Yeah. Adjective yeah. animal. Adjective yeah. animal. Yeah, exactly. No doubt. 100%. For sure. Um, well, let's get back to the sports yeah. agent or agency for you really quick. Um, what When you left VaynerMedia mm -hmm. and you were taking some time off, what in the world made you think that you could just start a sports agency against all the mega companies that yeah. were out there? So, um, You're just the most confident man in the world? No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm confident, but not yeah. the most. Um, so while building VaynerMedia, what is now VaynerX with Gary, um, we also did, and I just mentioned it, um, angel investing and then eventually venture capital work. And so when I left the media company, um, I probably had between 50 and 100 investments between my personal investments and, and the fund. And so I left, I took some time off. My original plan was to take a year off as a sabbatical, um, play a bunch of golf, enjoy life for kids. I have three kids under five now, so like, I, and I knew I wanted to build Let's that go. family. Yeah. 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 And like, so it was just like me and my wife, she was my fiance at the time or girlfriend or wife. I forget the timing exactly. <laughs> Married, fiance, engaged, whatever. We just hung out. And, um, but I could only hang out for so long. And so I used my portfolio companies as like a little bit of an outlet to not get completely disconnected from like having my brain exercise. Doing something, yeah. And um, what I came to realize that summer, because I left right around Memorial Day of 20... 16, I think it was, um, 50 to hundred investments. A lot of them really, you know, Uber was a portfolio company, Slack, Coinbase. The company that I spoke to the most and had the most interested in was, uh, a small boutique sports agency that my now current business partner, Brian had started. He had three NFL clients and I talked to him more than, you know, the people at Uber, the people at Slack, the people at Coinbase, et cetera. And that was like my indicator, like, all right, this is what I'm passionate about. And I'm a diehard sports fan. And I, I also had the good fortune of meeting some athletes along the way uh, during the venture capital days and the agency days. So guys like Draymond Green, Duncan Sue, Carmelo Anthony, and they were getting involved with you know investing in entrepreneurship and things of that nature. And so when talking to Brian, I was just asking about like, you know, how'd your meeting go with this kid and asking about competitors and looking at the drafts. And I just saw a gap in the marketplace. I thought that I could take my experience with client services and building a team, take the network and the reputation we had in the world of media and marketing, and then apply what I learned in business and entrepreneurship and investing and create a completely bespoke, unique package to offer athletes. Uh, so we ended up buying a majority piece of Brian's business, rebranding it to Vayner Sports, and off we went. I Crazy. think it's I the opportunity to sit back and like figure out what exactly you want to do. Like It's probably the biggest luxury on earth, right? The biggest, and it, it was something that um, I took a lot of pride in and I really wanted to have. I'm somebody that is like a big planner. I always know what's next. I was super eager to get in the world of business. I didn't even want to go to college. Like I knew where I was going to school early. We started VaynerMedia before I graduated college. Like I was always somebody that had what was next ready to go. And when I was leaving Vayner, I did like a year long offboarding um, just to make sure it was done well. And so I had a lot of people come to me in those final three months being like, hey, like I know you're wrapping up in May. Like let's start this business or come be the COO of this mm. business or come be the CEO of that business. I said no to everything. And I said no to everything, not because I, I wasn't, I didn't think they were good opportunities. I wasn't flattered. I just said no to everything because I wanted to experience the greatest luxury in the world. I yeah. said, I want to go into my sabbatical with zero preconceived notions and zero plans. And I literally just want to like float for a month or two. And all I did that May and June was play golf, cook every meal. Cause I never have time to cook. Like, yeah, that's I was just, like you know, like we, my wife and I, we spent the summer in Martha's Vineyard up in uh, Massachusetts area. It's a little island off of Mass. And like every single day, I was just like cooking seafood on the grill, not checking my inbox, you know, wow. played 18 holes earlier that day, walked my dog for an hour playing, by the way, 
Pokemon Go exploded that summer. I was <laughs> okay, all yeah. in. I was my dog. <laughs> yes. My dog was in incredible shape. I was taking like two and a half hour walks, exploring, right, exploring the island <laughs> yeah, because it was really cool. It was on just Martha, running like, around Martha's Vineyard like yeah, this. that's exactly. Yeah. Holy like, shit, I was, Pikachu. I was not the only one, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know, I'd be like in town, grab a donut, find like a Caterpie, and keep it moving. <laughs> yes. Like it was awesome. Going to the gyms, so like my dog was never in better shape. That's I love amazing. it. People, like the opportunity to do that. Yeah, was, I think you need both sides, though, right? Once you, there's only so many meals you can cook and, go, and golf you can yeah. play. And, and then and, it relights the and fire. And Pokemon yeah. you can catch before you're like, all right, I need to dive. My back sabbatical in that was supposed to be a year. Uh, I only did four months. Yeah, yeah just the summer, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was perfect. But Memorial that's a long Day, time, though. By a, the way, yeah. an eternity. Four yeah. months to just kick in, it. It's a while. An eternity. It was awesome. We had friends and family every weekend, and it was just fucking awesome. Yeah, and then you go back into it. I think everyone got that during COVID a little bit, where everyone's a like, little bit. wish I could have time off. And then everyone did, like, oh, my God, please let me get back to yeah. for sure. life. Yeah. And for it, the people that have, like, that drive, right, it def- definitely light that fire underneath For you. sure. It, it did was, for it me, was a right? Recharge. After a couple months of being stuck in the house, I was like, I'm ready to get it. Yeah. I'm on fire. Let's go. Yep. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. Um, a lot of our questions to some athletes, like the curiosity that our listeners and viewers have from how – much they get paid, how they get paid, and all of these things because we idolize athletes and all of that. Mm. From a sports agent perspective, how much do sports agents normally get for negotiating deals for players in general? So it's sport by sport. Um, so in the NFL, it's 3% max of the contract. Um, in baseball, I'm not a primary agent in baseball. I only have secondary certification. I want to say it's 5 or 6% in baseball. Okay. Um, and then, so it's sport by sport. It's usually in that single digit category. Uh, call it between three and six uh, for most sports. Uh, for marketing deals, uh, industry standard can go as high as 20%. Nice. Um, so if you're getting an off the field or off the court opportunity, it's that. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how it looks. That's awesome. It is a lot. Do you see more of your work going towards the marketing deals like in Vayner? Because I feel like that's such a huge aspect, right? Some normal sports agencies kind of pass that yeah. marketing stuff off versus you guys. Yeah, obviously. we embrace it just yeah. because it's a differentiator for us. We have that network. You know, I think a good example you can look at is we have, uh, we have Desmond Ritter uh, in this upcoming NFL draft this weekend. And um, <clears throat> we just did a deal for Des with uh, Scott's, the lawn care product. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and it was a great you know, we did a lot of great content with them. It was talking about, you know, the backyard and how that shapes a young athlete. And uh, Scott's is a big Vayner Media client. And that was just a one plus one equals 11 sure, type situation. Sure, sure. So there are a lot of things that we're able to do that because helps. of uh, our sister company. Yeah. And it's mutually beneficial. So we embrace that. Um, but, you know, I think um, truthfully, in terms of the finances aspect, you're going to every agency, as long as you have great players, you're going to make more money on the playing contract than the marketing. Because if you think about the marketing, there's only a very small percentage of athletes that can actually do like seven figures a year in marketing. Got Just it. the cream. Sure. The absolute it's cream it's the, the 1% of the 1%. Right. Top of the top. Do you, I mean, you obviously started a sports agency for a reason. Is there like a problem in the sports agency world that you're solving essentially? Yeah. yeah I, I think so. Um, I think it's. Um, I think it's an industry that doesn't do a good enough job of actually supporting the client. I, um, you know, like I said, I had a lot of conversations with a lot of athletes and then I got to know it even more getting into the business. Um, I think overall the industry is not up to snuff as to how, how it should deliver. Um, I would then also say the other layer that has kind of been instilled to me. It's kind of like, um, I'm trying to think of the right way to put it, but, um, Basically, it's like that feedback loop, right? Where if you do something, think of it like as that mouse experiment, right? Where I think they can like get in the wheel or the hamster. Right. The mouse or a hamster gets sure. in the wheel. And if they run hard enough, like the food will drop. Yeah. And then they go eat the food and then they go back on the wheel and they basically got the positive feedback that if I do this, I get this. Yeah. Um, okay. And for me, my version of that using that kind of weird analogy is uh, disruption. I am, I am naturally, because of everything that I've really done in my career, I have a positive feedback to disruption. Yeah. My, I am wired to believe that if you do something disruptive, you will be rewarded. And so I think the, the NFT project is a good example, right? Yeah. Like we are the first agency to have successfully launched an NFT project. There's been other agencies that have launched them. I've seen them, but they literally launched them and then nothing happened. They're right. dinosaurs. Yeah. By the way, yeah. the other ones, not to name anybody by name, they didn't even do, I just saw you did this yeah. like up and down. They never even went up. <laughs> there was no up or down. It was just like, it went live and it was crickets and yeah. nothing yeah. happened. 
And so we're the first agency to have successfully launched a real, actual, thriving project. That's disruption. My brother and I launching a social media ad agency in 2009, that's disruption. For and sure. so, uh, you know, the investments that I've made in things like Uber and Venmo and Coinbase, that's disruption. So my 15 years of being in business, I've been completely hardwired to believe that disruption equals success. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to do in the sports agency space too. It's what's incredible. like the larger picture for this? How many sports are going to be enveloped into? I think the eventually there's no reason not to be in all of them, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't want to build a house of cards and I don't want to recreate um, some of the mistakes that maybe I've made in the past. But like we're in four sports now. We just launched the NFT project. I'm not in a rush to add a fifth, but maybe we add a fifth next year, maybe a sixth. After, like I don't see any reason why we need to stop. Yeah. yeah, we actually have noticed that you've been adding a lot more to Vayner Sports. You've added, obviously, you know, baseball and gaming and MMA. Yep. What sport in general has the biggest upside in the next five to ten years, do you think? That's a great question. For sports that we're not in, probably basketball. Great global oh, sport. Wow. Um, the players there, those are – if you look at, like, the percentage of the, the 1% of the 1%, basketball players comprise a lot of that. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. The – there are many football players that are the equivalent in terms of like, you know, randomly the 12th best player in football makes way less money than the 12th best, best player in basketball. Those like I was, far. Those NBA yeah. contracts far. are right? amazing. Well, not, not even that. Also marketing. Yeah, okay. Contracts are great, but so football's got some big contracts too. I'm talking about the marketing, right? Like I remember I was watching, I think around Easter, Easter and Passover weekend. Um, I think I saw Zach Levine on like three different commercials. Yeah. Zach Levine's dope. That, that is not a knock on Zach Levine. But whoever Zach Levine's exact comp in football is, is not in three commercials. Sure. Do, do you sure. think that's because the, the face and the likeness is, is yes. on the TV? Or also just the pool is a little slower. Like there's 12 Both. guys on a roster Both. instead of 53, right? Both. Both. It's um, and face. Face, yeah. Face at all times, no helmet. Yep. More games. More Ooh, exposure. More games. Uh, better international presence. Basketball is just more loved internationally than American football. Um, they play offense and defense. So they don't come out like don't come the best. Field, yeah, yeah, the best basketball players in the world. They're playing, you know, 32 well. to 38 minutes. Exactly. Football players, like, if you're, you know, if you're a premier quarterback and your defense can't get off the field, you're like sitting on the bench waiting sure. to get back on. And so yeah. there's a lot of and less players to share the limelight with. There's a lot of factors. Nice. Interesting. All right, basketball. So I think basketball. Um, Drew and I are both <laughs> parents. What sports should we make our kids play <laughs> yeah. to make the most money in the future? Great question. It's got to be baseball, uh, right? It's got to be baseball. Dance. Baseball's great, but I'm also not. But like, I also don't want to underestimate how hard it is to get to the point that we're describing. Of it's like, of course. so I'm going to give you some of the like the the next level cheat codes. Perfect. To achieve that, because yeah, I could say baseball, but yeah. like, okay, great. Go teach Good your luck. kid to have like <laughs> yeah. the best hand eye coordination yeah, yeah, yeah. in the yeah. world, or a hundred mile an hour fastball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I actually think a pretty good one, as far as like if you just think about like the competitive set to it, um, and the size requirement. Long snapper is a good one. Wow, Long really? Snapper? Long snapper. You can, make, you can make real money. No shit. You can make by the time your kids are ready, they're making seven figures snapping a football. What's, right, the, what's the league minimum in the NFL? It's like seven fifty. Yeah, seven yeah. something. And by the time your guys are ready, it's probably a million. Sorry, right, I month. need a female sport for me though. Where do I go? Where am I? <laughs> yeah. Gaming, female sport. Gaming's great. Yeah, gaming's great. Soccer. No. Oh, no. I like I like women's soccer. Um, you know, our, our American team does great, and there's real yeah. financial opportunities there. Um. Yeah, it's probably gaming or soccer. Okay, I like that. I'm gonna get. I got a controller in my in London's hands go. right when I get <laughs> yeah, home. Here's the iPad. <laughs> how, how many kids and how old for you guys? I just have one son. He just turned two. Okay, uh, and then I, I have a, a, a stepson ish, 14 years old. Got it. Yeah, I have a daughter. She's 13, almost 14 months. So we're nice. we're in the baby. By the way, if Vayner Youth League starts, we just want to make sure that okay. we're in the noted. yeah we're noted. in the in the in the row here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, noted. All right, duly, I like this. Duly noted. Um, <laughs> speaking of college sports. Do you think NIL is going to help or hurt college sports? Help tremendously. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I, I can't think of too many things. Now, keeping in mind there's, like, serious problems in the world. And there's serious, like, issues in the world. So I don't want to undermine any of those things. But, like, I, I'll, call, I'll, I'll make the scope sports-related. Yeah. There was no bigger unfairness in all of sports than college athletes not being paid. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, there's a lot of chatter from traditionalists or people that are jealous, like, oh, these kids are getting paid is ruining like the, the sport itself. That's nonsense. These kids were getting paid already. 
Yeah, or just under the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Let's, Let's just change go. it from under the table to over the yeah. table. Yeah. Or through cars, if you right? don't, If you don't think that boosters and other agents and, and schools themselves weren't paying these kids already, you're delusional. For sure. And so, but that was a dirty world and a bad world. Now, it's over the table. These kids can actually have professional representation in terms of a marketing agent as well as a financial advisor. And, and there are real people with real needs that bring real value to these programs that are now thankfully finally be able to be paid. The example I always use that always bothered me to no end, and I'm glad we actually had a pretty good example of it this year, and it was kind of almost like this year was the right version of the wrong version of that. Taking it back to the tournament was, uh, you guys remember Dunk City? Dunk yeah. City? Yeah. yeah. For, for oh, yeah. Gulf Coast? Yeah. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Dunk City. Those kids had an incredible Cinderella run, and they were fucking fun to watch, right? Yeah. High pace, running gun, almost like Showtime Lakers type joint sure. yep. from a school that none of us heard of. Yeah. Nobody sure. heard of it, right? They had that great run. Here's how it netted out. Every one of those players, especially the, the starting five and the sixth man, none of them made the NBA. Yep. Most of them played uh, in Europe, in some, you know, Turkey, Russia, Spain, whatever. The head coach, can't remember his name, got a huge contract to become the head coach at USC. He oh, paid, it worked out for him. Yeah. The school enrollment exploded. Of course. Exploded. You look at the year over year data of Dunk City and Florida Gulf Coast, and how many kids were going to Dunk City or Florida? I'm calling it Dunk City. Yeah. 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 How many kids were <laughs> rebranding? It's branded. Like, yeah. Enrollment exploded. Right. It put Florida Gulf Coast University on the map. Yeah, yeah. Everybody involved with that for-profit institution made bank. The only people that really didn't financially benefit from the run was the players. The that players. Did it. Yeah. That yeah. did it. Now, I, I mentioned the example this year. We had, um, what was it, St. Peter's? St. Peter's. St. Peter's. Yeah. Peter's. Uh, what was it, Doug? It made the, yeah, he got a lot of the deals. It worked out for Doug. Yeah. As it should have. Yeah. 100%. Right? He had the look. He had the personality. He was making plays in the tournament. And, and he, he got like a deal with Buffalo Wild Wings during the tournament. Yeah. That's how it should be. That's yeah. fair in my book. Do you think like the only uneven aspect, I, I think the biggest complaint that I've seen, because I totally agree with you, right? Even the smaller scale people who can make a couple thousand bucks who might not be on full scholarship, right. like, right. A, like especially since I have a daughter, right? It's like a girl who's on like a semi scholarship for volleyball yeah. or, and she's yeah. really big possibly exactly. in just the town and she's exactly. not making 50 grand at Buffalo Wild Wings, but she's making three grand. Which is great. Whatever else, yeah. right? Which all these kids need. Which, sure. are, which, yep. which subsidizes a lot of the college expense, which is massive, you know? But the, the biggest issue that I've read about and which I kind of agree with is still the shift between massive schools and smaller ones and being I able don't to see sell it. it. You I don't actually think don't so. see it. So I'll use an example of a, a non-client. Um, I won't mention him by name. But there's this really talented player. This is before NIL. Really talented player that uh, had like 50 offers. And um, he could have went to Bama. He could have went to Ohio State. He could have went to Georgia. All offers from everywhere. Five-star recruit. Ended up going to a school that you, you would call like a rung below the Bama, Ohio State. Like still a big D1 school. But it's not USC. It's not Georgia. It's not Alabama. Yeah. It's not Ohio State. It's not a bunch of those schools right. that you would expect. It's not a school that's traditionally ever in the top 25. One of those 26th to 50th best teams in the country traditionally for football. And the reason why he went there was because that was the best school that told him he would start as a true freshman. Mm. At Bama, at Ohio State, at all these other schools, he would have to wait his turn. And, and I've already seen it <coughs> Excuse me, in this most recent recruiting class. Um, you're going to see a lot more kids, in my opinion, skip maybe the traditional powerhouse for the opportunity to play right away so that in turn Be they can visible. monetize. They can yeah. monetize yeah. the Cincinnati's or, or yeah right yeah. yeah I think do you do you think in general then well because we spoke about this before you came on the show as just discussing the topics is that kids won't jump to professional sports before they're ready because they have it'll an help. opportunity yeah, it'll, it'll help make some money and maybe cushion pockets. them a little bit it'll help without being like so blinded by yes. like the money yes. that they're going to make in professional because they can make money at college too yeah and they're not um, dying to buy a burger right i yeah. i heard a bunch of kids to your point low i've heard a bunch of kids say like the biggest reason they went pro was because they needed to help their family as fast yeah. as possible sure. yeah 100%. but if they can make 100 grand 200 grand 500 grand at school they can do the right thing and wait an extra year and improve but still like help their parents keep the lights on and make 100%. the best decision for the future right exactly yeah. because if you make the wrong decision yeah as a rookie you're going in too early that your career essentially takes the path to that's right. ending that's right very quick that's and right. very Absolutely. soon that's very real i think that's going to be and is it like the 
Is it like a thirsty business now for everyone trying to hop on the trying to negotiate these college? It's always deals? been. Yeah, it's always been a thirsty. Now business. it's now it's just very visible. <laughs> it's public. just starting earlier. This is a this is a thirsty business. We got yeah. somebody singing in the background. Yeah, what's going on? They must have just hit. Is there horse racing on? They just hit a yeah, super. Sure. I, love I think that. that dude just hit a superfecta. Yeah. <laughs> Because he's hyped. Yeah, what get this know? guy some win. That's crazy. Like, what an unbelievable thing to add. I mean, how about the college, like the major college superstars from the past looking on this? I mean, yeah. they, must, they must be so happy for the kids on there, but also like, man, I wonder. By the way, I just a, wonder. A bunch of my clients. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they text me. You know, we put, uh, we put a client of ours, DJ Uyangule. He's the Clemson quarterback. Right after July 1st hit, we were able to get him uh, a national TV commercial with Dr. Pepper Sick. as part of their Fansville commercial and you bet i got a bunch of texts from current nfl players being like man did i miss out man (laughs) did i miss out especially the college athletes who were superstars in college and maybe were middle of the pack my point with florida gulf coast yeah like just absolute or how about the injuries like uh marcus Lattimore? remember him the running back Yeah. yeah career ending injury in college never got an nfl paycheck he would have made a bunch of money uh, he was the Niners or something, right? Yeah, like, even like, but he he never made he it. Never made and, it and his yeah. knee never recovered. No, but even for like sure. the superstars, like the like remember the USC Reggie Bush Matt Liner days. Like, could you imagine? It, it, because the they were they, they were oh. beyond superstars in college beyond. in Southern California, like the hub beyond. of it all. Yeah, yeah, beyond. Reggie for sure. That would have been like one of Liner the most too. lucrative Liner. college teams no of all question. time. No question, <laughs> especially compared to where where the careers they were, were. They were the thirty third NFL team, Facts. and they were more popular <laughs> yeah. than half the league. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they were. They were like they were like the eighth. They were a top five important. NFL team. Yeah, they were like sure. yeah, they were like the fifth most important football team in the world. Yeah. If you, if yeah. you went yeah. to a, a brand team. and gave them a list of like no five question. quarterbacks no or five running backs and added Reggie Bush and Matt Liner to that, they would have both been in the top five. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like they missed out big time. to the end zone next next day. They missed out big time. I believe that. That's just unbelievable. Uh, I mean, look, if you do want to start a podcast division, we're, we're <laughs> yeah. athletes here. Okay. This is extremely I mean, I'm, I'm a little tired. I might break a sweat yeah. by the time we're done. So. Anyway, we'll keep you hydrated. Don't worry. I mean, hey, people question whether esports are That's a sport. That's what I'm saying. And, yeah. so, Vayner Gaming crazy. can have a division. Vayner Podcasting, <laughs> we're 18 months out. We're, we're almost <laughs> yeah. there. All right, all right. We're ready. Um, by the way, Chris is here. With pretend Chris isn't here right now, would you rate Chris on a scale from one to ten? In what regard? Just in general, in life, you know. Man, I, I mean, I'm at a ten. Yeah, he's at a ten no, for, for sure. real. Like, first, it starts with the fact that his email address is like Jets twenty four eighty or something like <laughs> yeah. that. I saw that today, so that that endeared him right away. He's a beast. Yeah, he's a beast with like Jets trivia and history. That endears him a lot to me. He's a great part of our MMA division. He he's hooked, the best. He he made this happen. He's so. the best. Absolutely. Uh, uh, he's a ten, and and his hair is dope. Like, his he's got hair a lot, is sure. He's got a lot going We're big on hair guys. That pushes here. him to big eleven hair. out of ten yeah. for sure. Yeah. Everybody he's brought onto the bob with us has made a comment about his hair. Yeah, it's, I, I, I think it's yeah. My hair my hair is well below average. So when I see a good head of hair, I respect, I respect it. There's some respect. Love yeah. that. To the jeans. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> to the jeans. Yeah, my hair is a mess. I'll be bald in five years. It's okay. It's great. It looks right. Oh, let's go. See, bring it out. Yeah. I don't know. I try not to mess with. I try to keep things natural. By the way, we yeah, were so. looking for photos of you as well. We need some more. We need some more non-blazer I'm, photos I'm, I'm on you on the internet. That one. Yeah, yeah. That, that's from like eight or nine years ago. That's a good one. Yeah, it was. It was hard finding uh, yeah. some action shots. They were all very. That's fair. We're doing. A, we're doing a. We're doing a uh, uh, AJ photo shoot as well while we're here. Right <laughs> here. It's, it's real good. Uh, we thought it was really funny. Uh, in every interview, pretty much on earth that Gary V does recommending, he recommends that everyone gets on TikTok. Yeah. You're his brother. You're not on TikTok. True. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think my brother recommends that based on what your goals are. Okay. okay. Um, I never really had a goal of building a personal brand. Okay. It's not interesting to me. Uh, I'm more of a behind the scenes operator that might change slightly based on like what's been going on lately with the NFT project. And I think Vayner sports as an agency, we're kind of hitting that next level. Um, you know, explosive growth, doing really well. Like we did, uh, like on the football side, for example, we did four of the top 15 free agent contracts. We're going to have between like two and four first round picks this weekend. So like things are going really well. So major, maybe that changes. And if that ends up changing and I do need to make my personal brand a priority, then, uh, I'll switch gears and I'll have a TikTok. <laughs> there it is. There I love TikTok. I got love for TikTok. I yeah. love TikTok too. I scroll yeah. more on TikTok now than any other platform and it's not even close. Easy place to fall down a black hole. I'm addicted. stuck you know for two hours. You know super underrated piece and segment of TikTok? Golf TikTok. Golf, I love golf, golf instructional TikTok. TikTok. Do you follow Manolo? 
I do. Golf? Yeah. He's the best. He's, he's like the, best. The, the Cuban or yeah, Mexican yeah, guy great. that does the funny accent. He's, he's like great. golf tips? Is it like funny golf or just golf tips? Hilarious he's, golf. He's guy. funny. Hilarious. But there's like, but like I geek out on like the super technical, complicated golf yeah. TikTok too. Because I'm, I'm a passionate, it's my number one hobby golfer. I'm like a nine handicap, so I'm pretty good. But like I want to be better. Sure. And I definitely pick up just casually going through and seeing stuff and I'll see one thing. It's like, do you struggle with this? I'm like, yeah, I struggle with that. Yeah. And then oh, I watch that's it. Me. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. me. And then I watch it and then I bookmark it and then I go to the driving range and I watch it again and I try to rep like it. TikTok's helped me go from like a 14 to a nine in the last 18 months. Talk about an opening line resonating with someone's like, hey, are you struggling with golf? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm fucking trash. Yeah. <laughs> go on. Like, go on. Golf, there's like 89 things that go into a golf swing. Sure. Oh sure. It's like, is your left elbow one degree too low on your backswing? I'm like, yeah, it probably. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't fucking know. insane. It's you impossible. Know. A good golf swing is impossible. Sure. Like, yeah. It's crazy to me. I agree. That's why people are addicted to watch people who are good at golf and just snarling at them like, God, it's unbelievable. Sure. So the most guys frustrating guys. thing in the world. Uh, NFL draft is tomorrow. NFL draft, if you're hearing this, NFL draft is today. This comes yeah. out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. NFL draft question real quick. One, in the NFL draft, how significantly do the contracts shift between which draft pick you are? It, it shifts. Yeah. Um, you know, off the top of my head, roughly number one overall is getting like 30-something million guaranteed, whereas like number 15 is getting like 14. It, it gets wow. – it's real money. It, it, it goes. Um, I think the lowest – again, I got to look at it. I think the lowest at the end of the first round is like 7 or 8 million. So there, it's a pretty significant gap. And yeah. like once you get out of the first round, you know – you get into the fourth, the fifth round, you're talking about a few hundred thousand dollars guaranteed by the time you get to that point. Yeah. That's such a massive, it's massive, massive difference. It is. Do you think these rookie con do you think the rookie contracts are at least decently suited for, for players, or do you see any issues in how the the rookie contract situation is structured for the NFL? Well, in the NFL, I think in general, there's um there's a gap between the contracts compared to say the NBA and the MLB, mm -hmm. uh, primarily around like guaranteed money and things yeah. like that. So in general, I think there's a long way to go um, towards improving how players get their contracts done. I like to think that our team is a part of the solution. Um, a new member of our team, Mike McCartney, who just joined us as an agent, uh, 20 plus years as an agent, and I think he deserves a lot of credit for pushing the industry forward. He did um, Kirk Cousins' oh, fully nice. guaranteed three-year deal with the Vikings a few years ago. And what he's done for Kirk, who's now a Vayner Sports client, I think has been a master class. Kirk's in Va on Vayner now? Yeah, yeah. The guy so, who's made more money in the NFL than anyone else in the past five years? Is that true? That's true. I, I should probably know that stat. That's still, true. I'm still getting, acc I'm still <laughs> getting, That's true, by the way. I'm still getting more, acclimated with more uh, money than anyone over the past just, five years in the so NFL. Kurt just became a client like last week. Nice. Uh, well, I'm just we saying, just, shout out to your, yeah, shout yeah, out yeah, to right. your no, guy. Mike, yeah, yeah. Mike, yeah. Mike's a beast. I've been chasing Mike for like four years. Um, and, uh, and the team that, you know, he brought on Jamie and Kyle, his partners along with him. So we've added three new NFL agents in the month of April this year. And, um, you know, that Kirk Cousins fully guaranteed three year deal, I think, helped pave the path for what Deshaun Washington Deshaun just Watson did with Cleveland. Gets, yeah. I don't think Deshaun gets that deal without Kirk's deal existing right. as precedent. And now that Deshaun and Kirk have those deals, more quarterbacks need Change to follow suit. And then soon it'll trickle down from quarterbacks to left tackles and receivers yep. and edge rushers and things like that. So there's progress to be made for the rookies. You know, the rookies, it used to be the Wild Wild West. Um, my business partner, Brandon Parker, his father, Eugene, rest in peace, one of the greatest agents of all time, um, did some legendary shit with rookie deals before they, um, they ended up basically capping the upside. It's now a slotted system. Mm -hmm. You actually can't, like, whoever's the number one pick later tonight, they actually can't negotiate, like, the, the high-end part of the compensation. It's slotted. Right. There's things you can negotiate around language, like default language and offset language, but the actual money... Uh, I know Brandon's father, Eugene, he actually did a deal for the number two pick that ended up being worth more than the number one pick that year. Oh, wow. And, like, that doesn't exist anymore because of slotting. Yeah. And so, Got it. you know, rookies took a big pay cut. I want to say Sam Bradford was the last rookie that went number one before it changed. I want to say Cam Newton was the first under the new system. Mm. And Sam made something like... 15 to 30 more million than Cam did on his rookie deal. Because they used to be open-ended wow. contracts, right? They used to be completely Wild yeah. West. That's why there was more holdouts and things like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of the veterans, when the new CBA came out, I think in 2011, uh, made a push to cap rookie earnings. That's crazy. You know, the mindset was, what the hell is this rookie doing? He hasn't accomplished a damn thing, and he's making more money than every other player on the roster. Sure, yeah. sure. We've got future Hall of Famers making less than this kid. So that, sure. that was the push to get rookie numbers down. To make things change. 
as as an owner of an agency, do you ever get nervous with your players coming to Las Vegas in any sport? Not really. Good. Good. Um, nice. I think if you look, if you look across the board, we have a very high standard from a character perspective. Um, we don't recruit a lot of guys that have you know real question marks in the character department, and so um, you know like. You guys had Alan Robinson on the pod, right? Yeah, great. AR, he's in he's emblematic of like our client list. Yeah. AR was here. I didn't think a second of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but there there right. are players, and I'm not judging them. There are players that are a little bit less mature, are a little bit more uh, call it risky with their personal life decisions. Sure. And there are agents and agencies that cater to that. Yeah. And uh, we actually just run the other way. And again, I'm not judging them. It's just not. Um, of course. It's not what our focus is. We're looking for that high blend of talent and character. You have awesome. to have an ethos, right? Plus, there's plenty of players for every agency. Plenty, for sure. To 100%. Plenty go of players. After. Plenty, plenty, plenty of players. We have eight in this draft amongst our six agents, and that is plenty. Yeah. Not to mention college just opened up, so now there's right. All we the got a bunch of kids in NIL. Like, yeah, we're. There's plenty. Yeah, for sure. Um, funny question that we had thought of. Celebrity boxing had its brief moment, yeah. obviously, for like a year. Yeah. If you and Gary had to face off in any sport, what would it be? And you got to choose a sport. I got to choose. You got yep. to choose. You get to choose. Uh, golf. I'd, I'd kill him in golf. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Let's go. To go. be fair to my brother, he has an incredibly nice natural swing, which never plays. He's played 18 holes maybe twice in his life. Mm. I play to a nine right now, nine, ten. I, don't, I, I think if we play 100 rounds of golf, I'd beat him 100 times. Wow. And purely because he just doesn't play. If I take that off the board, probably basketball. I'm probably taking eight out of ten in, in one-on-one basketball with him. He'll sneak a couple in. He's scrappy. Yeah. But he'll admit I'm a better basketball player. <laughs> yeah. On the flip side, to give my brother some love, he'd trash me in tennis. He okay. def- he, he'd probably win 100 out of 100 games in tennis. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of the, can, the slate. Can we, like the Vayner Olympics yeah, sounds Vayner like Olympics. a really <laughs> legitimate Vegas charity-style event. Hey, you in play. Know. All right, I'll send you an email. We're... we're, we're Everything's on the table. There you go. I'll set well, Especially yeah, when it comes to sports. <laughs> yeah. Sports. Let us compete. Sports. Yeah, I the, love that. The Vayner Olympics. This is great. Um, go back to your investing real quick before we wrap up the show. Yeah. You've invested personally and through the fund in some, as you mentioned, some of the yeah. biggest companies, Coinbase and Slack and Venmo, et cetera. Through your funds, what company or and personally, what's been your biggest financial win in some of these? Uh, my single biggest personal financial win was actually Bitcoin. Oh, uh, okay. I bought okay. a stack of Bitcoin in 2013. Fuck us. Uh, All right, yeah. And I sold some of it along the way, but I still actually have some. Okay. Um, so that... 2013, prob- good year for Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I paid 250 a coin. About. Oh, my God. Oh. That's By the way, that's $2.50. No, 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 no. 250 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that early. 250 bucks. I wish it was two, two and a quarter <gasps> or 250. Um, as a company, probably Uber. Nice. Um, I got to give a big shout out to my friend Travis Kalanick. He's one of the co-founders of Uber. Used to be the CEO of Uber. Yeah. Um, Travis. So here's our story. It's both my biggest success and my biggest failure. Uh, When Travis first came up with the idea of Uber, he didn't operate it. He hired somebody to operate it. And he was was still retired from his prior venture, uh, his prior venture. He came to Gary and I said, hey, I'm going to raise some seed capital. Because we knew Travis before Uber. And he's like, hey, I'm going to raise some seed capital um, for this idea I have, side project type thing. I got... This kid that I hired to run it, like you guys, interesting. We're like, we weren't as liquid. I, I mean, I was like 23. I didn't have that much money, and, and my brother wasn't as far along in his career. And so we passed. We're like, man, we love you. It's a great idea, but like, it just doesn't fit what we're doing right now. So we passed on Uber Seed Round, which hurts tremendously. Oh Ooh. My gosh. But, but to uh, Travis's credit, and my brother and I got out of our own way and decided not to cut our nose to spite our face. Travis actually came back to us with their Series B Round. And, uh, and both Gary and I invested personally. This was before our fund existed. And uh, the big shout out that I have to give to Travis was that um, he really came through as a friend there. Uh, their Series B had a, an investment minimum. I forget the exact number, but I didn't have the money to hit the minimum personally. And he actually went to his board and asked if they would carve out an exception and let me put in less money, which I did. And, and he got greenlit. And so I put in a little bit of change into Uber uh, below the investment uh, requirement. And, uh, you know, they obviously went public That's and awesome. it, it worked out really well. Sounds you know, like yeah, salute it, to him for that. What it, a friend. Call it like nine or ten years later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, unbelievable friend. And I got to see him because uh, he lives in L.A. I got to see him during the Super Bowl, which was really nice. I hadn't seen him pre-COVID. Yeah. yeah. Um, great dude. Great entrepreneur. 
What was the valuation difference between Uber seed round and Series B? Way too much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that Uber seed round had to have been so, so small. I want to say, yeah. say they probably did their seed at like between 8 and 10 million. And I think the B was at 300. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, it's by the way, I'm not increment. complaining. Still yeah. got to invest at them at 300. 300 million is they still the deal of the billion. world. Yes, yeah, so yeah. we want to be tens of billions. But, uh, yeah, it would have worked out a lot better if we had just written that check. Oh, my at gosh. The it's incredible just to have friends who are starting. I mean, Uber Yo, oh, no is question. in a group of companies that's. No question. My little fun fact that I get to, it's like my icebreaker that I get to, as a humble brag, is that uh, I'm Rider Zero in New York City. So when they launched Uber, they did a program called Rider Zero. And like I think Tony Hawk is Rider Zero in LA. It's the person that takes the first ever Uber in a oh, city. Oh, come on, wow. stop. And so Travis is Rider Zero in San Francisco, their first market. Their second market was New York. I am Rider Zero. Travis Sick. called me and he's like, hey, what are you doing right now? It's like in 2010. I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm like in between meetings. He's like, can you take like a five minute Uber ride? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, we're ready to go in New York. And I like, where's your office? I'm like, we're on 22nd and 3rd. He's like, I'm literally, we have one driver. I'm literally gonna send them to 22nd and 3rd. I'm gonna text you to like open up Uber and you're gonna see a single car and you're gonna book it. And I'm like, where do you, he's like, just go around the block. So I literally, like he texts me, he's like, go. I open up Uber, there's one car in all of Manhattan <laughs> and it's right next door. And I just say like, book, I get it. I walk downstairs from my office, I get in the car. He's like, where are you going to? I'm like, bring me right back here. <laughs> so we literally make a right, we go down, we make a right on 2nd Ave, we make a right on 21st, make a right on 3rd, and he drops me back off the corner, I go back to work. And, uh, and I got like a receipt in the mail, thanks for being Rider Zero. Um, some of my friends actually got it like printed out and framed, and it's actually the coolest hanging thing. in my office. Like I am the first person to ever ride an Uber in New York City. That's sick. That's the coolest That is cool. It's a Come fun on. flex. That's really yeah. fucking cool. Like, once my kids are a little bit older and I can tell them that, they'll be like, it won't make yeah. sense to them that no. you were, that you were like imagine if like my grandfather was the first person to take a taxi that yeah, would exactly, yeah, come on. blow my fucking mind yeah, that's like, exactly the comparison yeah, like, that the kid hey, would I'm never right? understand right? I'm yeah. the first person who flew on a plane yeah, exactly. or something yeah, like, like shit's cool I was so. the first guy to fly down a yellow cab yeah. wild right? first person to make a call on an iPhone first right? I sent yeah. the first text message so, yeah. really really fun like flex that provides no monetary value to me, but awesome story I get to tell for the rest of it's, my it's life. It's culturally relevant. It's, it's like the biggest thing. By the way, the things that you can't buy have the, That's true. the most it's price value, yeah, it's priceless. right? You know? sure. So thank you, Travis, for both those instances. That's a gem. That is awesome. Uh, dude, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, this Travis was awesome. Was a lot Congratulations of fun. on everything. Thank, you, thank Sports. you. Good luck tonight in the draft. Let's go. Sure, Clean yes, sweep for Let's Vayner. go. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Thanks, All right, Travis. guys, at the Residency Pod, we'll see you next week. Later.